Thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, it's quite a special occasion because uh, it will be the first time that I'll be talking, speaking in public about this particular research. I've done a number of that before, which I'll be touching on lightly during the presentation. But this particular research, which is in a sense even still going on, uh, is now at a stage where I feel somewhat comfortable speaking about. Um, and one of the really interesting things, and that's why I was so happy that Pramesh invited me, so, so it enables me to um, share this, this work and the analysis as it stands now with a wider audience. I'm also very keen on, on feedback uh, afterwards. So more or less your own private experiences, your thoughts, but also maybe reflections on some of the conclusions. Maybe you, you completely disagree or you agree, but I'm very keen on hearing that. And that's one of the, um, the great things on actually presenting this work. Uh, you may notice that I've changed the title somewhat. Um, for the Fikroli skin thing, which Pramesh just mentioned, that was a couple of months ago, I did a small, uh, what you could call, installation of um, images in which I tried to contest hegemonic ideas of male beauty and masculinity. And what it kind of built upon, the title of it was The New and New Male. That's also the title as the lecture was advertised, but the title I myself will be using more sort of as a rat rat through this presentation is the one that you see above the new middle class professionals. But coming back on that idea of the new and new male, which a lot of people are interested in, what I tried to do in this particular pop-up art installation was to weird that idea a little, to queer it maybe even uh, somewhat, by, um, by first of all looking at sort of this ubiquitous presence of Indian male imagery in advertisements in public space, basically everywhere. And that's a development I've observed sort of on being on the increase in the past decade or so. And what I find interesting about it is that it's suddenly there, we've all come to find it more or less normal. Like every Bollywood movie now comes with a scene where one or two scenes where the, the male hero actually take off, takes off his clothes, bears his body, and um, you know, all these images are layered with certain ideas. So we've come to find it normal, and we've come to find it normal that they exist in our normal space. But what if I actually take these images out of normal space and I insert them in another normal space? So I try to, what I tried to do with the installation was bring that about a bit as a discussion piece, and I'll show you a bit of, a bit of them. So to give you an idea, this was actually the, the warehouse where the, the pop-up was done, um, which at the time still had stuff in it. And you see a couple of other them, like this is Poppy Pondicherry, this is the same warehouse, um, uh, this is just a spot in, in Bangalore, uh, this is somewhere in Mumbai. So all of these images were sort of inserted, and they were not supposed to look um, particularly professional or good, they were purely manned that way. So this, this idea of the new Indian mill really is, is um, a baseline upon which I position my research, uh, which revolves around this idea of new middle class professionals. Um, so what I'm going to engage in my, in my um, presentation here is to really um, examine, so what can we actually, what are new middle class professionals? What are they exactly when we, when we think or talk about these people? So I think I need to to clarify from the start, new middle class professionals, the way I look upon it, have come up in, in the recent decade or so as a result of rapid economic growth. The economic growth has slowed down maybe somewhat now, but there have been years of, of rapid economic growth, and with that have come all sorts of new um, uh, new spaces in urban <coughs> India, in particular in urban India, but urban India has become quite large, and it's come to include also much smaller cities, not just Bangalore, and Delhi, and Mumbai. So, so this economic growth, in a sense, has also come, has come obviously with new wealth, but also with new modes of consumerism. People consume in a, in a new kind of way. They're giving shape and meaning to consumerism in a, in a new kind of way. And so what you see is that you know, with the emergence of, of malls, of mall culture, of all sorts of other spaces that are connected to mall culture, um, there's, there's also been a growing need to actually staff these places with professionals who are able to um, who are able to sell products who are able to deliver certain services and that's that's basically the people that I am mainly interested in so in my work I, I look at three different um, brackets three different groups um, that's certainly not exclusive in any way there are, you probably maybe you can do that at the end think of a lot of others um, 
but as an anthropologist, I can't possibly focus on all of them. So I, I had to select a couple that I thought were particularly interesting and that, in my own way of doing field work, are also connected in a certain sense. So um, currently, I'm, uh, I'm on a fellowship in the London University. They've enabled me to do anthropological field work in Delhi, although I've also done some field work in, for instance, Patna, as well as Mumbai. Um, and the way I go about these things is I try to look into categories that are also in some way connected to each other, that have some form of connection, either through the fact that they exist within comparative or connected urban spaces, or because they themselves recruit from the same source. So one, one group I look at are the, the coffee baristas, um, mainly those who work for um, coffee places uh, such as Starbucks and Costa Coffee, and to a lesser extent, um, Coffee Day or baristas. Now we're coming back to why that is at a later stage. There's actually a, a third chain which is now becoming more popular, uh, which is the, the coffee bean and the, the tea leaf. Um, but as, as a group, I call them coffee baristas. It's, I'll just I'll work with that category. It's not the most. Um, it doesn't capture the entire group that I look at. Uh, the same goes actually for fitness trainers. So these are the guys who work in the gyms as fitness trainers or as personal trainers, gym instructors. A lot of different words that people use to indicate the same group. And the third consists of shop attendants. Many those who work in the high end mall. So they're looking specifically in the Emporium Mall, which you have in Mumbai as well as in. In Delhi. And on to the right, you see some people in action. Actually, I, I didn't, didn't find any picture of people who work in the Weaver Tom, but you can probably imagine what that looks like. They sell handouts. So, you know, that when, when I speak about something called a new middle class professional, there are a couple of brackets which we, I think we must problematize immediately. Um, so the first one is actually, why would I call them new? What is new about a middle class professional? Didn't you always have those? And in a sense, yes. Immediately, yes. We've always, India has always had chai balas. Or India has also had a coffee culture, mainly in the South. But there were always specialists, professionals who made coffee. Um, the same actually goes, like, there have always been gyms. Though certainly not in the kind of number India has in these days. There have always been small gyms on the, on the corner. and. And same goes up, obviously for shops. The shops have always been there, have always been shop attendants. So then the question is actually, so so why call this new? And one of the main reasons that I try to that I use the term new is that by themselves the jobs come with a lot of expectations beyond the actual activity that people are recruited for. So while a coffee uh, barista is still making chai or coffee, um, the way he's doing it and the way he's expected it to do it, the way, for instance, he's, besides the technical skill of making a coffee, also expected to interact with customers, to learn actually from customers, to be in a certain space and create a certain environment is not something that was ever expected before of a chai wala. The same goes for a fitness trainer. While, in a sense, maybe a fitness trainer as a profession hasn't changed all that much, it's still about pumping weight and making people fit. Um, the way that he needs to sell himself on the work floor, or the way that the industry itself needs to position itself in India as a, as a, as a safe place to go to, etc., as, as a place also that's befitting of a middle class lifestyle, they have to completely reinvent himself. And in a sense, for instance, move away from an older image that clung to these gyms as a site of you know, sort of these food types or bouncer types, you know, these sort of not really kind of seedy types that you didn't, as a family, wanted to be associated with. Um, and the same comes for the shops. Um, as I said before, it almost feels redundant to say, of course, India has always had shops and people were always selling things, but this whole way of, of being in Emporium Mall and being in a high end shop and what is expected of you makes it a, a new kind of category. And I think overall, what also really makes it new is the fact that these days the numbers have increased so much, especially when it concerns the first two categories. So the absolute numbers of people working in these professions have increased very rapidly in the last decade. So I already um, touched a, lot, a little upon this. Um, so why would I label them actually as professionals? What makes them professional? Um, and one thing I've noticed with all three professionals they come with a very specific idea of knowledge and knowing. Like, what is it actually to know um, whether you're a successful coffee barista or a fitness trainer? 
and, and how do people actually internalize that knowledge? How do they acquire that knowledge? All these streams are highly specific. And, and with that, one of the things that makes it so specific is that they're highly infused with globalized knowledge. So the jobs tend to be the same all over the planet. And not just that, that's also expected of you to work in these professions. So you kind of, they build upon a more global understanding of what it is, the coffee group stuff. So say you work for a Starbucks, a Starbucks employee, the kind of atmosphere that he tries to create inside a Starbucks itself is by itself built upon a global understanding of a glo what, what Starbucks expects of you as a coffee barista. So what happens a lot in, in all three categories, you see here a couple, like on the left you see Gold's Gym, which is a, has been a major site of my film work, they very kindly cooperated and, and introduced me to a lot of their trainers, their managers, etc. So Gold's Gym Ha, um, runs, for instance, a Goldstein Academy through which it trains its own employee. Uh, Starbucks, on the other hand, has an in-house um, training facility that teaches its people to how to make coffees. But in both cases, it doesn't stop there. It comes with a lot of other skills that meanwhile are addressed in terms of your attitude towards the customer, um, um, uh, the way um, the brand itself envisions it to be communicated towards the customer, um, and then connected to that is also the fact that um, those involved in these professions often do a lot of um, self-teaching themselves as well. So the internet plays a, a huge role in, uh, in becoming a professional in these categories. Not so much actually the coffee barista, but in particular the fitness trainers. There's all these online courses that you can actually um, enroll in against the fee, of course, and um, up your skill level as a fitness trainer. Certified training in various. Um. So, the third um, element in the mix is why would I actually call these people middle class? And this is always a huge discussion. And I think it starts with the question itself is what do we understand of the, of the Indian middle class? Uh, in many ways, there is no such thing as the Indian middle class. We all know that it's a heavily layered concept. There are many different layers. You could already start by talking about uh, lower, middle, and upper. Um, but I think any question with the middle class always starts with size. If you look at various studies that have been conducted in the last 15 years, it basically started with Pavan K. Varma, who wrote this book, The Great Indian Middle Class. And after that, you've got a whole range of different Lila Fernandes has written a very important book, and quite a few. And almost all of them on the very first page engage with what is the Indian middle class? How can we possibly define it? I've argued before, actually, maybe it makes more sense to call it the in-between class. But it, it's in between, it's sandwiched in between categories of which we're fairly certain how to define them. You have the category who lives off about one to two dollars a day, and then you have that group in the middle, and then comes the, the elite class who so, um, in terms of spending power, outranks so much everybody else that it's also a very clear bracket. Oh, um, then you have this massive category in between, and, and there's at the same time, there's a lot of different ways of talking about the middle class as a result of that. So, um, one thing that has not been looked at all that much is self-awareness in terms of position within the context of being in the middle class. So, what you see in studies of the middle class is that people have tendency to focus on either the lower or the middle middle or the upper middle class, and then write a book about that, look, up, look upon it in a certain way. But what leaves sort of uninvestigated is how people reflect on these perceptions themselves. If they already have a certain reflection on this and a certain belonging within the context of being middle class, and how do people actually look upon being in that particular bracket? And then furthermore, actually, do they also have notions of upward mobility, of strategies in order to climb? And how does that actually work? Um, you see the, the categories of of lower, middle, and upper are defined in, in various terms, and it really depends on whom you talk to. Um, so one thing I've, I found in earlier research among um, typically upper middle class Bangaloreans was that a lot of them do not so much define it in terms of money, but actually bring in the question of education. And then not so much education of the children, but also of the parents, and in some cases the grandparents. So upper middle classness was very much about this idea of being educated, educated middle class, and that by itself came with a certain social cultural knowledge. And for them, you know, when we talked about something like the new middle class, which you also hear a lot, those were typically, in their opinion, lower middle class people for whom 
being middle class was very new. But that newness was again defined very much through that notion of, yeah, well, you know, they may have a lot of money. In some cases, actually, more money to spend than the upper middle classes that I, that the people who saw themselves belonging to this upper category. Um, but what set them apart was still this social cultural knowledge. And that was also seen as a main facilitator within these brackets and where people saw themselves belonging. So what, what gets really interesting is like, okay, so these are all opinions that people have on themselves, but then how do people actually go about acquiring the kind of social cultural knowledge to become awkwardly mobile? Um, so this is particularly something that, um, that that I guess is almost a red thread in this entire research because the reason I started looking into these various categories is precisely because I was curious about how people actually strategize from a particular position into the next, etc., and how do they acquire knowledge knowing certain social cultural skills that might help them along the way. Now, I've been doing anthropological research in India for, um, for a while. Um, initially, I was involved in a project that looked into the, the lives and lifestyles of IT professionals in Bangalore and in the Netherlands. Um, so these were either people who were stationed in, uh, in Bangalore working there or who came to the Netherlands and worked for Indian companies as, as, as expats. And what, was, what I thought was fascinating was um, for them, and this is this is more than ten years ago. For them, the profession of IT professional was also seen as a new middle class profession, but it was bracketed completely somewhere else than the, the coffee brewery stuff today. It was much more seen as an alternative for upper middle class people um, who wanted to do something else than um, be uh, the typical doctor, engineer, lawyer, dentist, sort of all these straightforward professions. One, one interesting line in that research, I won't say all that much, I published one paper which actually was, was titled the, the IT cast, looked at um, arranged and love marriages in the context of working in the IT industry. And a lot of the paper also deals with how do people in uh, certain categories such as the upper middle class actually reflect on reservation policies and why they ended up in a place like, uh, why they ended up working as IT professionals. But when I, and one of the ways I always work is I'm very interested in family history. So I do multiple interviews and um, and then I go back and back and, until I have sort of the whole family around. It's super annoying to be in as you, if you're being interviewed because I literally <laughs> want to know everything, including the name of your dog. And um, so it, you try to filter out like, okay, so what does the family actually look like? What is the educational level? Where, what kind of universities do people go to? Sort of going and then really trying to create a map of, of that kind of context. And in this particular case, of the, um, you sort of, the parents of them both have college, university degrees, sometimes even PhDs, uh, in, in some cases also the grandparents. So a, ver a variety of things were very common for families. Although they spoke, for instance, Canada tongue at home, they also spoke fluent English. Uh, the parents are very used to college sort of uh, trajectories, etc. So all these things were highly connected. Um, then in my PhD research on um, Indian students in Australia, um, which I, um, uh, I was involved in for, for almost a decade, um, I started getting involved in the topic in 2004, sort of been in the process of rounding it off now. Um, there, what I noticed was there was much more of a sort of a middle, middle class element that way. Um, um, Australia was seen uh, by many as an alternative to other destinations, study abroad destinations, and um, in, in the growth of Indian students, I find it very hard to summarize this in a couple of lines to make sense of it. But um, you probably have seen in Indian media also the, the enormous rise in Indian student numbers going to Australia, right? Um, so the recruitment often was, went outside the bigger cities and included provincial areas. So the, the, the mixture of students that I interviewed were of a much broader range. They were most definitely not lower middle class, if you can even use that term in that context, but definitely in sort of that more, more in-between layer. So there were much less parents, for instance, with um, college degrees. English speaking was also less common, etc. So there were ways. And the, the findings of this, these two researchers have informed 
in a way also what I'm doing now, simply in terms of positioning, and I'm, I'm very much aware of how clumsy all these terms are. I'm sure some of you are already sort of cringing with this idea of the lower and the upper and the middle, even because they also denote a certain hierarchy which is obnoxious in many ways. So let's move on from there. So please forgive me for using terms that I myself am sort of well aware of how problematic they are. Um, so to flag one of these professions, because I can't really engage in all of them, um, I thought I'd, I'd specifically delve into that of the gym trainer a little. Um, and the gym trainer really came out of, for me, my interest really emerged out of this spectacular growth of the, of the fitness industry in the, in the last decade. I remember coming to India about 14 years ago, and if I mapped that throughout the years, I've literally seen these gyms pop up everywhere. And these, Large chains come in, such as Fitness First, Gold's Gym, uh, Tal Walkers is now everywhere, although it's an Indian brand. Um, you have Snap Fitness, which I think is an American origin. So you have these branches all everywhere. And to illustrate, for instance, I was recently in Patna and I conducted interviews there, and um, there are now two Gold's, chain, Gold's Gym, um, large Gold's Gyms operating in Patna Center, which I think in many ways is not something you'd expect to be there. So, you know, the, the, the kind of spread of all these places has been very, very rapid and they're opening up everywhere. So, um, my main field work takes place, uh, I, the way I always work, I'm not the most traditional anthropologist, so I do participant observation in a number of sites and then I complement that with interviews, which takes me all over town and sometimes also outside town. So, in the more traditional sense of anthropology, that, that's not something that, but increasingly that's what anthropologists are doing, also building upon the fact that people themselves are also much more mobile than they ever were before. So, in a sense, I think as modern day anthropologists, we should be open to that as well and sort of move out of the village or out of our neighborhood study or out of our one place. So, one place I, um, I kind of try to spend almost every morning in one particular neighborhood gym in, in Delhi where I try to interact with the trainers and the customers. And while being there, I try to get a sense of who actually works there, what are the backgrounds, but also what are the clients' backgrounds, what kind of interactions are there, and what kind of mobilities. And I find particularly the mobility is very interesting because the mobility is in many ways also my side to other sites in the city. Like I, I often um, talk to and interview people at Starbucks, so how I'm also interested in sort of how is the Starbucks connected to the gym and how is the gym then finally connected to Sakhir, Fas and Kunj or um, etc. All these walls that, that make up sort of the Delhi landscape. Within the context of gender, the gym trainer is a, is a category by itself. There are a lot of different functions within the gym which also recruit differently. So the lowest ranked are the hands or the helpers or as they are commonly referred to, to the spot boys. Um, then you get the, the commonly present gym trainers who are simply there on the floor to assist you with your workout. Um, the gym trainer in many ways is not that different from a fitness instructor. Um, and then you have your personal trainers. And the personal trainers are often gym trainers who are bound to a particular gym, like Tolbar Coach or Gold's Gym. And then you have your personal trainers who work independently. It's a particularly interesting um, category because they often have a whole range of skills which they offer and uh, through uh, word to mouth, etc. They're able to recruit their um, customers outside the gym and uh, provide them with workouts but also with uh, nutrition, uh, dietitian advice, in some cases also physiotherapy. And training takes place either outside the gym, like uh, completely outside, or at private gyms which are on the rise currently in, um, in urban areas. So an increasing number of apartment buildings have their own gym or the apartments themselves come with a gym of their own. But the gym trainer, um, or the gym, the, 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 the trainer itself, um, uh, in many ways he's a, he's a salesperson. Um, he's not just uh, somebody who provides workout, his, his activities extend well beyond that. And, well, the, it might be fascinating to, to observe a workout. The workouts themselves are actually the least interesting aspect in my research. Everything that happens around the workout is much more fascinating. And in the case of a trainer, um, by sort of looking at them as salespersons, you can you get a 
sense of all the other things that is required to be successful as a gym trainer. Um, so how does that work? I, I don't know if it seems I was just talking this morning to a person who, um, whom, whom I gave a bit of insight into the fitness industry and I, I noticed that this was completely unknown, so maybe, maybe just to her. But, um, the way the fitness industry works, the way the Gold's Gym, Snap Fitness, all of them work, is um, your base salary varies somewhere between eight to 15,000 per month. But you're able to supplement that with personal training. And the way personal training works is, so what happens is a gym trainer is on the work floor and he attracts a certain number of customers who want to know like how should I do my workout. So obviously the body plays an important part in there because um, especially among men, you want to look like you know the best trainer who is really sort of done done himself well up. But then that's really not the only thing that um, that makes the difference in that whole setup. Um, he also needs to find a way to communicate and level with his customers. And knowing that many of these guys come from lower middle class backgrounds, but interact on a daily basis within the context of the gym with people of uh, much higher uh, up middle class backgrounds, at least in terms of wealth, um, there's a considerable difference. Is also uh, a considerable gap in experiences, for instance, with the global, uh, with with traveling, with living, with living standards, etc. So one of the things I found in my research is one of, one of the things that is a key ingredient in, in being a successful trainer is being able to level with your customers. And that eventually is also a key ingredient in making sure that your customer, your client, signs up with you as a personal training client. Um, and like I said, the, the Gold's Human Old Exchange work more or less the same in that they, um, the, way they, the way they recruit, um, the payment of the personal training goes through Gold's Gym itself. So the customer pays Gold's Gym and the trainer receives a commission. So that makes him actually a salesperson. The more clients he's able to attract, the more money he's able to raise. And the more senior he becomes, the higher fee he can actually uh, raise to his customer. And the fees, that is also dependent on a whole range of factors, not just seniority, but also what kind of uh, courses were you able to enroll in, what kind of certificates have you brought in. So a lot of the guys actually invest quite heavily in that by doing online courses and upping up their profile in terms of bringing in more clients. One thing I forgot to mention actually about almost all of the, the people I interviewed is that um, this, this idea of the new middle class professional is very much also one where, um, how to phrase this in the best possible way. Um, so their whole education trajectory and their whole careers are actually run um, not parallel to the more traditional ones where you go and get a college degree and then enter a particular profession and then make a career. Um, almost all of them are self-made people in many ways. They follow their courses online, they, uh, um, they invest heavily in their own education, but all the education happens at home on, on their computers or on the job. So if a trainer is able to successfully bind a number of personal training clients to him, he can very quickly raise his salary from maybe he was earning 12 before and then he goes up to 25. And um, within the context of working for a gym, um, it can go up to about 65, to even 70,000. So that's considerably more than you would make in a start position. So it's also very important that you find a way to quickly get these customers in. Some other professions that exist within, within the gym is, for instance, the manager. You'll find that in the gym almost all the other people are admin staff, so they don't have fitness backgrounds at all. Um, the manager will make about 35, 40. It also depends on the size of the brands. It also depends on uh, guest seniority, etc. Now, increasing one of the more successful ways, um, one of the most successful trainers are those who in the end are able to let go of these gym chains and provide the training outside the chain almost altogether. And I've, I've, I've interviewed uh, a number of them and what, what is really interesting is how, um, how quickly then the, the pay scale comes up and how much closer they move into the ranks of those who have a far more traditional career trajectory in education. And I think this is typically one of these things that's really new about this situation. Coming back to the new as before is that you get people who kind of bypass these 
more traditional ones and are able to, as entrepreneurs, almost successfully position themselves in urban India as people who generate considerable money. And not just that, actually also are very much admired, talked about. Uh, so really moved away from a for more sort of old-fashioned ideas about whom that would be. And then it's between brackets because it's such a rare category also, and that's where Bollywood comes in, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about Bollywood in a bit. Um, certain personal trainers are then able to make their ways into Bollywood ranks, and that's where um, the pay scale really sort of starts going up very So we did a couple of interviews with people who are, have Bollywood connections or worked on movies, among which one who was uh, involved in the training of foreign actor, for instance, um, for Bhagna uh, Kaba. And then you get into, and that, that's also the interesting thing about this particular category. For, when I got into this, I thought the, the, what to emulate is basically Bollywood. What, you know, they said they want Bollywood star bodies, so maybe they want to be in Bollywood. Actually, that's not something that came from my interviews at all. Most of them actually, the big aspiration is to become a personal trainer of Bollywood stars, because that's where the really interesting money is. And just to compare it a little, I can't say too much about it because of the time, but um, sort of a barista at a Starbucks makes about 13,000. Um, a shift manager then goes up to 18, an assistant manager 23, and 35 to 40 for a manager of respect. So just to, to give a sense of um, what the pay scale is. Now, the, the, the Bollywood connection, of course, in, in, in the world of fitness training is very striking. I think one of the reasons that um, the fitness industry was able to grow so ph phenomenally has to do with the impact of Bollywood movies and the fact that almost all Bollywood movies now come with a specific, uh, with a, a specific scene, one or two, sometimes three, in which the actor shows off his body. And, uh, you see some examples here. Um, I'm sure you all know this with the left one is of course probably like the right one of the back of and, um, and in the middle one. So the middle one is actually more interesting to me than um, sort of the presence of these images the whole time and the fact that increasingly it seems that the success of the Bollywood movie also depends upon the insertion of these particular scenes where male heroes um, show off their bodies. In the middle, what you see is that the actor hangs out with a trainer and shows up their abs. Now, this is something that runs parallel to the launch of almost every Bollywood movie at, at the moment. Every blockbuster movie with an important star not just comes with these scenes where they show the bodies, but also with the whole story of how these bodies get made. So instead of getting a making of the movie, you get a making of the body. And to the right, you see that the making of Milk Cow, we could have talked about the making of the movie with all the different things, but the focus is now really like how was he able to make that, that body? How did that body came about? Uh, often in an extremely short time, if you look at the time span that movies get shot and the preparations get done. So if you browse through um, uh, Men's Health and all these health related magazines, you see a lot of images where. Um, Trainers and actors pose together, discuss their workouts. So, Hiridu Prashant did a book um, with an American or British, I'm not so sure where he's from, could be Australian actually, uh, with Chris Gavin. So, he's published a book even about his workout routine for, uh, for his most recent movie. So, this has become a really big thing. Um, so, movies themselves don't just come with bodily trends, it's even discussed now in Bollywood that, you know, um, when you want to launch a, one trainer, even talked about it as a new body type. He said when he sat down and we wanted to figure out what his movie needed to look like, we wanted to also create a sort of a new body type so that uh, the body needs to look in a specific way because that's why we all start talking about it, right? And so that's also why they have very leanness and bigness and etc. in size and, um, and the way they are reflected on and the way of course they are um, um, advertised, like this particular picture on the left side. Um, which sort of hints back to a more labor class culture, which in the photography for the uh, Milka movie didn't happen. So, so what, what, what now makes this interesting beyond the quirky? And that is that these images are not just about attractiveness and about being talked about, but at the same time also that they are layered. Um, because of that, they, these images don't just exist 
by themselves. They exist in a certain context, in the context of a movie where a particular story is being told, or um, in the context of a, a magazine where they are featured in a certain way. So what these bodies also are now layered with mainly um, uh, is, is, is this notion of success and certain class and position in society. So having been able to create that body also means that you've been able to achieve that in, in a wider context of achievements. And that brings us back about this idea of new masculinities and how these masculinities um, get communicated through, uh, um, through public media. And that is in terms of this idea of that you've that it's become an accomplishment. That's, for instance, how Hollywood actors constantly talk about it, being able to do it. That's how the diets translate, and that's also how they make their way into the gyms, and, for instance, how they then subsequently get picked up by trainers. The interesting thing is that this is, of course, sort of a, you could call it a meta narrative. It fails constantly. I mean, almost nobody is able to pull this off. Um, it's, it may be a growing number of people who come with very specific, you know, have these specific body types, but. In general, if I look here at the uh, the audience, I'm sorry, or even at myself, I mean, who has such a body? It's an extremely rare thing. It's also not a simple thing, and so uh, it also causes its its a fair amount of stress, of course. You know, an increasing number of stress. And if you look at the studies, more, I mean, there are a lot of studies done on um, how women have been affected by all these um, photoshopped images in public space. But increasingly, this is also something that that men are faced with and men are affected by. And there are already a couple of studies that look, for instance, into uh, body dysmorphia issues, which is basically you look in the mirror and you don't see the real shape and size of your body, but you see an extremely fat body, which is another case. So, but also like food issues and all sorts of, they're all on the rise because of that. And I don't want to demonize it all too much here. It's not specifically something I look into, but just to, to give you that notion that also with this layering of these, no, of these bodies, which are not just now they're no longer just working class heroes, which they could be in the past, and which we could then look the other way and say, well, you know, as an academic, I can't possibly have such a body. This is the kind of body that generated out of hard work. That's over. This is the kind of the new sort of urban expectation. And of course, in all these endorsement deals, that's where Hollywood artists, of course, also make their money. Um, they're not just present in movies, they're also constantly present in all sorts of advertisements and all sorts of contexts where they're actually not that important. So I'm just never really aware of that time. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay, yeah. I rushed through this a little. So uh, just to juxtapose it a little, there has been a lot of research on the body and on man, meaning that before. I'm really not the first to look into this. But just to give you a sense a bit of these, these images, you see like there's been research on Gandhi, there's been research on yoga, Gandhi's, you know, Gandhi's body and its function within the independence movements have been widely discussed, uh, 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 Holy Man and their various relationships to the body, of course, most of it's subtle, most of it related also to yoga, um, and how they are layered with certain notions of masculinity. There have been discussions also how in colonial days the uh, Indian man was positioned in a particularly feminine way instead of masculine way, etc. So I do look at these various studies, but they're not really that fantastically useful to understand this more modern phenomena, since it so directly builds upon more globalized notions. Yet, um, the, and the same actually goes for, and I, I know you have Thomas Blom Hansen here the other day, um, uh, who has actually done a little research and written about, for instance, the connection between Hindutva and, and bodybuilding. For those of you who have seen India today this week, um, the cover image is of a uh, guy's back who's posing with Modi painted on top of it. I'm sure you've seen it. You see the guy here on the right, the right picture, that's the, the same guy. So this, this link is still being made within the, within the Hindu movement, but in this particular research, and actually in Jim Coster, I found it not particularly uh, prevalent or important. Um, um, Yet I do take it in a little in my investigation also to see like how does this muscularization also affecting other domains. And one of the more quirky, the more at the same time more interesting one is the, the mythology domain. So um, in, rec in recent decades or so, a lot of the Indian gods have, have become decidedly more muscular than they ever were. I've already come across a number of uh, Gandhi's images 
which now have um, uh, have abs. Which is really peculiar <laughs> thing, right? I mean, wasn't he the god that holds sweets in one hand, but apparently the sweets are now protein bars. So it's, uh, it's all very much changed. Of course, Hanuman is, um, so I, a sideline of my research dealt, digs into um, bodybuilding. If you go to a bodybuilding competition, everybody first worships Hanuman. I mean, that's very much what. So that may be not so surprising, but even Hanuman is now a considerably more sort of a bodybuilder type than he ever was. And the same goes for Ramanyana, Mahabharata, religious, especially when they're done through digital art and they become cartoon figures, but even in the more recent Mahabharata TV series, you see the same thing. Um, of course, there's been, there's been, the body has also figured into studies of traditional sports, but again, they constantly talk about very sort of different body types which are very entered onto local notions of that. Um, probably this is, I want to flag this a bit. Um, so one thing that really emerges from this research is the idea of bodily capital. But one of the success things, what makes you successful trainers is able to translate these more globalized bodily ideas into localized strategies. So although we all, there is this idea, this notion, this man's health kind of notion, which if you compare man's health covers all around the world, you see virtually the same sort of lean muscular ideal male type image um, in various forms, so the middle one. But then on the left and right you see more sort of bodybuilding types. So one of the things is that this body capital is a very specific one. It actually takes time to figure out what the, it's a highly specific one and um, at that sense it can't really lean too much on bodybuilding ideal on the one hand or for instance the more Pelabani wrestling ideal on the other hand. It's a highly specific one which trainers need to familiarize themselves and in that familiarizing also understand what a client is going to see in there. I could say a whole deal about Foucault and Bulgaria, but it would be super boring, so that's not a good um, So in, in conclusion, maybe, um, I talked a bit about these new, new middle class professions and what they stand for. Obviously, I couldn't quite touch upon all of them, but um, what, what makes them central and so interesting in many ways is that they facilitate a new way of acquiring social and cultural capital and this by itself is then also the kind of thing that um, yes, makes them successful um, and in this kind of embodying play play both these globalized notions for instance of the body or of a certain behavior i wasn't able to talk that much about often the research but it plays in a similar way where you try to create sort of this globalized mob space where customers will um, uh, convenient and can sort of maybe lavish in the idea that they are not even in India anymore but in a place that could be anywhere on the way to somewhere else. Um, so these, these sort of globalized yet localized aesthetics need to be embodied in a way and that's precisely also in the end what, what makes them successful and but also what provides an alternative avenue um, uh, from uh, an alternative for more traditional trajectories, middle class trajectories. And in that sense they're able to facilitate a kind of social upward uh, and vertical mobility for um, a large group of youngsters who are using these opportunities to, to build their lives. Yet they're also able to facilitate horizontal mobility. So one thing that I've also observed is you have people who use this as an opportunity to do something else um, than become the doctors that their fathers were or the engineers that their mothers were. But then finally, and I think this is a remaining question that I wanted to finish off with, of course what we can't really say yet is in the end if this mobility, this mobility is imagined in many ways, the mobility is ongoing, but whether or not it will even really be possible in the coming years for um, people who now belong to a social cultural bracket which can be defined in terms of lower middle classes, if they will finally be able to rise to a certain upper middle class level, I mean, that still remains to be seen. There are still, of course, a lot of objects and obstacles in the way that might hinder that development. Thank you. So I'll bring up the questions right away. There's one over there. Are there any more? Actually, can we go this way? Um, you need a mic? Right? No. I'll give you a mic. And then we can. There we go. Hi, I'm Suparna and I actually have a comment followed by a question. So my comment was um, about the newness that you talked about and 
um, you know, the whole issue of control consumption and disciplining. Because a few years ago, or you know, in the you know maybe even 20 years ago, prosperity did mean a belly. I mean, yeah. that's what most men look like. But that has now got translated into a very controlled, disciplined body, with, which is you know what you're talking about. Yeah. So I I really enjoy the talk, and I think it does make a lot of sense in terms of conceptualizing it in terms of controlling and disciplining the body and that being a way to show that you're you know upwardly mobile yeah and the question that I had was whether you had uh, made any distinction or whether you found any differences between this sort of corporatization of professional identities uh, between Indian and Western companies so for example you gave uh, you know you talked about Talwalkar's which is an Indian company, and Gold's Gym, which is a multinational company, and whether there was any difference in terms of the way in which they were, you know, sort of professionalizing the staff who worked there. Oh. Should I answer them one by one? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, not that easy to answer, actually, because the differences are very subtle. Um, like, Tol Walker's has a very, um, you know, the guy who started is still very much involved in it, so it's, it's highly, so, you know, they still have their annual bodybuilding competition in Mumbai, for instance. So, in that particular case, in the chain, the, the, the bodybuilding is a bit more pronounced, for instance, than in a, Although, in the gold gym, still, Fitness First has completely moved away from that. So, if you look at Fitness First, that's really a, a, a space which has brought in a lounge bar, for instance, you know, where you can meet up with your business clients. And, um, so, in terms of, of course, that makes a certain difference from the staff as well. Um, Almost all of them have their own training facilities, which are also is also a revenue model. So Goldstein has Goldstein University, and what it does is it provides in-house training to um, for which you can sign up. You pay about twenty-five thousand rupees, and then you follow the course, and then you become a certified trainer. And from that batch of people, Goldstein regularly also recruits its staff members, uh, but it doesn't hire everybody. So it's that's another way of making money. Um, so yeah, all have their own subtle differences and their own focus points. So Fitness First will be a bit more towards the, um, uh, the, the, the health side of things, whereas Gold Skin tends to focus a little bit more on the muscles. That's also their own background. Yeah. Um, firstly, a comment on the, um, on the whole Indian wrestling Kushti business. Um, I, I disagree with what you're saying. Um, it goes back almost two, three, four hundred years. Uh, a lot of kings and uh, royal dynasties were, were actually patrons, where they had um, local competitions. Uh, these still exist today. Um, many traditional uh, akharas, as they're called, um, urban and suburban and uh, rural. Uh, so, so that's something that exists parallel to bodybuilding and, and to. Uh, um, and, and to take it further, um, if, if you look at the whole martial uh, um, tradition that that exists, um, if, if you see in, in Punjab, they have something called Gatka, mm. which is suddenly becoming very popular as a martial art again. People are doing it. Yeah. Um, you have the oriental arts, uh, karate, taekwondo, this, that, the other. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Israeli things coming in, uh, Krav Maga, for example, which is... Um, I don't know how that fits into your your, your structure here, and um, I, I find uh, the whole wrestling business and and, and the whole um, male um, sort of outlook to the body very ancient. Um, everybody doesn't really have a, a belly and a paunch. Uh, I, I know people who uh, generations, you know, grandfather, father, son. Uh, all are in, in the tradition and, and they might not even be um, professionals in terms of trainers mm. but they, they do that you know on the side so it, it's a comment and you know I'm, I'm still not clear where you're going with the okay now I'm taking the mic away <laughs> with the research ask a question do you want to have a question I did actually okay good. Uh, I can react briefly yes um, so the but it's really not to say that, you know, of course, yeah, Palwani wrestling is still very popular and it exists everywhere. It comes with its own specific body ideals, um, which have been discussed, for instance, in the work by Joseph Alter, but they're very different from the one that, uh, you know, 
gets juxtaposed in sort of an advertisement with, by Gold's Gym and uh, by that token also in Bollywood movies. So it's not my, uh, I don't want to create the impression that I think that that's somewhat lower or at least interesting or slowly disappearing. So that was not my intention at all. When it comes to Modi, it simply refers to the connection between muscularization of the Hindu movement and that at least still ongoing, but I have no further opinions about uh, how that is and what that is. Hello, sir. Sir, actually you said about the muscles and all, it is sculpted males, it is mobilinearity, why not uh, see, it is near health pointed career age professionals, the Starbucks, you know, they can they can have monthly subscription demand of food, now, every day they are phoning and calling for food, they can have monthly Ask subscription. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit of a bully, you have a question? <laughs> If not, then like we so come to comments later. Like, we'll we we'll come to comments later. Yes. Here and then. Is it alright to ask about Narada University? Yeah, sure. I mean, I don't mind saying something about it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, now, what is my question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe the uh, I believe this university is an attempt to revive the spirit of the ancient university. Mm. What is going to set it apart? What is going to be special about the new Narada University? Oh, the new Narada University. Yeah. Or we can also discuss that one second. Yeah, we can also discuss that later over yummy, yummy snacks. I yeah. like all the hands that are going to come to <laughs> Let me yeah. All right, my name is uh, Krishna Raj. Short and a question. And uh, what I would like to ask is why did you profile only these kind of categories? Because there are other kind of categories as well, like maybe in the uh, uh, beautician or, uh, no. you know, uh, limitations. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Next. If you have some assistance, one that one follow to you. Okay, uh, here, here and then here. Yes, uh, yes, Baba. Quick. Yeah. Is there, uh, since you're speaking about you like, you know, broken it down into lower, middle, and upper, are there differences in uh, lower, middle, and upper class males' perceptions about uh, what their body should look like? And then, is there a difference between them? I love that question. Yeah, that's I think that's a very good question. And that's very related question, so just. Yeah. I have a related question to this. Okay. Now, traditionally, women have been at the receiving end of this kind of pressure to conform to an idealized body image. And uh, it's kind of interesting that uh, now that men are at the receiving end of it, how are they taking it? Is there anything, I mean, uh, yeah. is it a healthy trend for them? Are they paying more attention to their health or is it landing on them in an unrealistic manner? Like, are they taking to steroids to, you know, resorting to that to yeah. achieve that image? As okay, so should I just say briefly? Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 coming back, I can be brief. Yeah, obviously, as I uh, flagged earlier, um, sort of health issues are on the rise among men who go yeah. too far in inspiring that ideal. So in that sense, it sort of mimics what women have been facing for a number of decades now. So steroid use is a big problem in India because it's highly unregulated, it's very easy to get over-the-counter prescription medicine. So I do follow that a bit and a lot of accidents happen. So yeah, there's a lot of health-related issues. As it comes to the... Um, uh, no, well, you know, everybody sort of watches the same Bollywood movies, but people are faced with different kind of issues um, in terms of the rotundity issue that you also, you know, this idea of having a sitting profession and what is actually possible in achieving. So, on the one hand, this kind of, you know, that, that highly stylized image is very popular as a way of emulating, but as I said before, almost everybody fails at that. That's, that's one of the big issues. Like, it's very easy to fail at you know, achieving that. So, and that is of course reflected on a, a part in different contexts. Um, for a trainer, this is a big deal, because that's his bread and butter. For a guy who works in IT, you know, it's like if he's a little overweight, his job will still go on. But the ideal is the same. Bollywood. Bollywood. Yeah, the ideals don't really vary, no, not at all, no. Okay. We're going to have one in front and then come back to that. Yeah, my one question is. One, one, one set. Actually, just go in front and then come back. Say. I think actually recruitment works a little differently. Like most gym trainers have been going to the gym themselves and then start realizing that that might be a viable way of making money. So they get their first opportunity usually through the gym that they were going to themselves because the manager simply says, would you be interested in being a trainer or a spot boy, etc. So that works a little differently. So I don't really think that people sit at home and think like I could become a coffee barista. So, you know, that's usually how it goes. Like the coffee baristas generally come from the pool of KFC, McDonald's, etc. So they first go into 
uh, working for McDonald's and then through the consultant they get picked up because they have certain skills, like certain English language skills that Starbucks for instance finds very important and then they stream into these professions and from there they stream also onwards, like to, for instance from Starbucks it's a small step to the uh, more high-end uh, restaurants or uh, the high-end hotels, the five-star hotels because also they've gone through a certain training which enables them to level with a certain clientele, both local and international. I, um, I really liked uh, one bit of the research which was uh, about, I mean you were literally talking about uh, an escape velocity for people, right? Mm. Right, that's what you're talking yeah. about. The horizontal mobility. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, you know, the, uh, maybe one aspect of this, uh, and, and which leads into my question really, is that, uh, you know, you're talking about process, right? Because mm. these are people, I mean, let's face it, I mean, India is not very process culture. Yeah. You know, as opposed to the West. So you're literally giving them process. But a lot of your definitions, right, about class, come in terms of money, yeah. right? Uh, are there any other attributes that you've seen, for instance, like belonging, like respect, mm. right? Because that's such a big thing in India, right? Yeah. Because we are a sort of collaborative yeah, culture. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, I mean, that was, that was my question. And my second question, I mean, this is really a, I mean, how, uh, do you see the Indian male as being uh, emasculated? No, no, no. I mean, these are very sort of uh, coming back also to English language, like these different categories. You know, there's a way of defining that, which is always a little clumsy because you look at money first. You know, it's the easiest way of. But like I also like like ideas of education, social, cultural knowledge or standing, which are often very difficult to synthesize. Like what is it exactly that sets this upper middle class identity apart from a lower or new middle class identity? Why do people talk about it? For me as an anthropologist, it only works when I look at the various discourses. So I don't have an opinion about this. So I just see that people <coughs> talk about this in a certain way. To give you an example, I, I've this small interview was done with me two days ago and it was translated into an article and the article I put on Facebook and it was subsequently picked up by a client of the gym that I do my field work out and she comes to me and she said, I thought it was really interesting because you're right, I mean, some of these low middle class boys have such a precise way of mimicking upper middle class lifestyle. Now, a remark to me like that is very interesting because she talks about mimicking. She uses specifically the idea that they're not quite there yet, but sometimes it's almost impossible not to set them apart from a lower middle class background. So that means that in a more, you know, in, in more archetypical way of envisioning any society, you would more or less meant being able to mentally map where everybody belongs, right? Because of skin color, because of last names, you know, caste, and then you would certain ways of dressing, you would be able to position. So it means that in these spaces like gyms, these things are slowly sort of becoming a bit watery, a bit unclear. And that's where it becomes interesting. And also where these categories become so problematic. And like you said, English language skills are very important in that upward mobility. Initially, uh, although in Delhi may be less so because the Hindi, Hindi is so much an overarching language, but um, here in, in Mumbai certainly you need to have these English language skills to move up the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you have said that, uh, and uh, there are so many things uh, which a good body can have an impact on people. And uh, you also commented that most of us don't have the body. So I'm actually curious, if uh, have you ever sampled a normal population? How many people actually have such a body? <laughs> we have to look for competition, right? I, I have absolutely no idea. I don't think there's any statistics on it. Um, so the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, see, this whole quest for concrete body, <laughs> Uh, what is really driving this? Is it just purely aping Bollywood, which we know in India is a big, uh, you know, pull? Mm -hmm. Is it genuine health concern? Uh, or is it some kind of a being in a self-actualization zone because you have to do real hard work to reach there, the real control? Or is it attraction, attracting opposite sex? I think that there's any good answer I would immediately say also. Yeah. 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 No, is it? 
as it goes with any of such an academic answer is of course all four, all four play a part. You know, it's it's about self-actualizing. It's about uh, insecurity. It's about health concerns. Uh, health concerns as it goes always go skin deep. You know, why do you quit smoking? You know, I'm super worried about my health. But usually also it's about your money in your wallet. Right? So, Have you seen anything being more a bigger driver than the other? Yeah. Or anything which has been a bigger driver than other? <laughs> no, people usually say health, but I don't believe that necessarily. I think health is usually what, what you know people like to say, but in the end it's very much also about how people reflect upon this and sort of judging you know, and you knowing that you once you have such a body, people will actually talk behind your back and like, wow, he's been able to have such a body. It's a, it's, these notions of attractiveness, aesthetics, which are constantly advertised to Bollywood, then they start playing the board. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take like three more questions, so raise your hand, and I already have the first two. So. Yeah, I actually changed my question because you answered uh, this. Uh, interestingly, earlier this week I posted on Facebook saying, uh, I want to know why there aren't any good-looking, articulate men in my social streams, because the ones I see are all behind a shop counter or in a parallel universe like television. Yeah. And your presentation really just pointed out that there is a parallel... Uh, I'd like to say parallel middle class because it seems a little uh, well obnoxious to say lower middle class. Yeah. Uh, is are are the men in my middle class really really thinking about that? Because that, like that lady pointed out, women have been subject to all these notions for several centuries, yeah. and I'd like to think we are making we are, we are kind of doing it all. Yeah. So really, what's wrong with it? I mean, come on, it's. It, it is completely realistic. I'd like a guy to be as stoned and as uh, successful and all of those as well. Do you think men are really taking that seriously? <laughs> you want me to answer that for us? You could. You could while I walk over the mic or the way that's there and then... Okay. But yeah. yeah, well, are they taking it really seriously? I think a lot of them are, but like I said, you know, failure, and I'm, I'm definitely going to write a paper about experiences of failure at some point. Might actually... In, you know, incorporate some of my own experiences. It's really not that simple. It looks very simple, and we also look often at the, the big guy with the muscles as the dumb guy, you know, to be able. But actually, it takes a, a tremendous amount of effort. And in a consumer society like India, where you get food everywhere, there are parties everywhere, drinks and culture on the right, it's really not that easy. So that's the simple answer. There's a much more complex one we should do often coffee. <laughs> but preferably one of the places as research. I actually want to intervene and mention something. We had Nimi and Rasmusami and the anthropologists at Microsoft Research earlier on. And since uh, Ramya, we had you as well talking at the Culture Lab and since we were, you know, that was research on a Facebook post. And she does research on lower middle class access to Facebook and how they use, um, how people from that segment use Facebook um, as a way of increasing their own social mobility upwards. Yeah. I know, I know, but I'm saying Nini spoke about that, Amelie, so I was just calling you out as a culture lab speaker. Um, and what came out of Nini's research was very interesting that in the end she said no. She said try as they might, people from um, the lower middle class, and I think she also used that term, despite having access to Facebook, despite using all the means, are not able to transcend because at some level um, it comes through either the English isn't perfect or whatever and then you know the girls whom it's mostly girls whom they're trying to talk to yeah. try and figure it out. Um, so class in that sense is that glass ceiling yeah. and you know that was my that was just you don't have to answer it's something that I'd like to right? reflect upon whether that will also happen because you left ambiguously saying we don't know if this glass ceiling. Yeah absolutely. As a therapist, uh, you know, when I look, it's a very interesting study and one of my concerns is although the career is evolving I don't know whether how are the parents have you know did it as a part of your research did you talk to parents as to how do they perceive it how is the society the family still perceiving because yeah. still there's a tag of unconventionality attached yeah. to it. Yeah, very much. I mean, especially when uh, it, it especially comes up with horizontal uh, horizontal mobility. So when people try to um, walk a different path uh, and really do something differently, often the parents are the ones who don't really believe in it. And especially the fitness industry is looked upon with a certain frown. Because a lot of parents still associate it with a kind of class and group of people that they don't want their kids to be associated with. So that's very much true. Um, hi, I have a question. Uh, so if you notice uh, the profession that you've mentioned, they're traditionally uh, looked at as part-time jobs because, because they allow you to have shifts yeah. over here. Right? 
Um, so is this a stepping stone for them to reach somewhere else? Is it a means to an end or is this the end? Uh, no, very much. I mean, the people I interview at these places like Starbucks and, and Costa Coffee, Coffee and all of them actually really look upon this as a trajectory. Um, you know, the kind of money they make is also, you know, we all think about it like it's a big step, you know, to, into these spaces because their parents usually were single shop owners or, um, you know, had small restaurants on roadside restaurants, etc. But in terms of money, it's really not that great. You know, 12,000 is really not that much, also not for the parents. So it's really a stepping stone. You, you enter these professions because you firmly believe that after that you're going to become a shift manager, an assistant manager, a full manager, and then you're going to grow into a five-star hotel chain where you have an even better job. So uh, as you don't try to hang into a coffee barista. I think the only difference is there, especially in Delhi, what I've noticed, um, the female coffee baristas, uh, for some it's simply something they do until marriage and then it stops. So, um, so there, but I think that sort of plateauing you have across the board. So, uh, but this is really a sort of side element that takes a lot more sort of sensitizing to, to bring out. Yeah. Hi, um, so with coffee baristas, or uh, people who work at shop and then in upscale malls, because they are exposed to a certain kind of lifestyle through their clients or patients, how does that impact their aspirations? I mean, what they choose to buy, or the brands that they prefer, where they eat, yeah. where they want to travel, to yeah, absolutely. And, and, and some of the people I've followed for a number of years now, so I've just this fellowship was for a short period that I've started this research a, a while longer, actually, by so some of the people I've known for a couple of years. And I've really seen that change where, you know, sort of making foreign trips becomes suddenly a viable option. Going on holiday, visiting friends in Europe, making a trip, visiting even one of my informants at some point came to Amsterdam because he was invited by a friend uh, in, uh, in, in France and was able to take the train. So. If you look at his background, um, where he comes from, and how he was able to level up through fitness training and becoming a personal trainer, you see a very interesting trajectory where where he is now. He could have never thought of that probably at the beginning, but it certainly fueled that journey by meeting and interacting with clients who were able to buy his services. And um, just to add to that, there's an interesting chapter in a book called Powder Room, written by Shafali Vasudev, whom we also had here. Um, so if you're not coming for events, you're really missing something because you look like a new face. Where she actually talks about, my whole chapter is to this particular girl who, who works at Emporio and she tracks her from when she gets her job and she tracks her through the job. At the beginning of the job, she's living in this house where she has a bucket bath in Delhi and she's very happy with her family, etc. But somewhere towards the middle of the chapter, because she's working at Louis Vuitton and you know she's exposed to a very different aspect of reality, she becomes, she begins to become very crabby at home, making fun of her family, saying, why do we have a bucket bath? Um, she breaks up with her boyfriend, and towards the end, she goes to Dubai because she just can't deal with this. It's an interesting chapter in terms of um, aspiration and whether they will be fulfilled or not. It also complicates a lot of ideas around mobility. Um, you can see the video online um, if you want. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, I hope there are no more questions because there, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this last, oh, you have one, okay. Make it, like, really meaningful. <laughs> so, no question. Yeah. Right, not, not all the people are going to reach where they want to reach. So, is, does that lead to some kind of social uh, problem in terms of you know people having aspirations, not being able to meet them, then going on to do wrong things, as he rightly just said, the lady went out to Dubai. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not saying that. He's putting words in my mouth. I'm saying <laughs> generally when you know. Uh, yeah, I can what you're saying. Yeah, so, so is that is that leading to some kind of a social issue? Well, the thing is now, um, just to, to give you an example of these sort of like Gold's Gym, University of Fitness First, which provides training or all these training institutes that now offer a commercial project for people to become fitness trainers. Obviously, not all of them will become fitness trainers. It's become a commercial product in which they, people fail, so it's going to be, uh, you know, the numbers are growing so fast now that not everybody will make it. So, yeah, obviously, I mean, that happens in every industry, I and mean, that's the way it goes. And it's very hard to find out what happens next. I don't follow people like that um, from, from step to step. I wish I could, because it would be very interesting. Like the book you just mentioned, I mean, that's a long-term involvement, which often happens by accident, as for me also the best things in my 
anthropological career have always happened through accident more than that I actually set out and went to Emporio Mall and thought now I'm going to find an Amani employee that I'm going to follow for the next 10 years. So, yeah. For research. For research. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the last question. I know you don't want to talk about Berto, but I think it's really relevant to talk about him and distinction. Yeah. And in that I'm going to contradict what I said earlier about Nimi's research where this glass ceiling cannot be breached yeah. and actually say that perhaps it can because in a lot of Bordeaux is this cultural theorist who wrote about um, distinction and said that people move upwards, um, you know, people get cultural capital, generate cultural capital, for example, you know, by observing um, what people who have culture do, for, for example, going to a museum and looking at art. Is a culture is a cultural practice, or like having tea a particular way is a cultural practice, and so you can actually by acquiring these skills acquire the patina of distinction. Yeah. Um, so why is it that then, whether it's someone like Nimi or you yourself, seen you ended on this rather? Why did you end it, end with this question mark saying perhaps this distinction cannot be acquired? Why aren't you more optimistic of of them breaking through? Now, I'm quite optimistic, but I think it will take a lot of time. And I think what we see now is development which is merging very rapidly, that it's only partly able to facilitate that kind of upward mobility. I think India still comes with very sort of layered notions of where everybody belongs. And that, that is really not that easy to... So coming back to that quote from that lady who said mimicking, yeah. that's where it sort of captures the problem, is that it's still very easy to puncture through it. People appreciate that it happens, but it's easy to see like it's not quite there yet. And these kinds, of, that's very that that's going to take decades. Obviously, um, it needs time to develop that and for uh, it, to become more egalitarian. So you know, if you, if I may final you know finalize with that, if you look at the the, the huge income differences um, that I showed earlier, like you know somebody who manages a Starbucks or a Costa Coffee or a tea leaf makes about 35, 40,000. If you compare that, that were, those were the startup salaries in Infosys 10 years ago. So if you, know, if you adjust that with inflation, you kind of get a sense of what a huge difference there is. Still, the income gap in India is enormous. Um, and so if you make a 15,000 as a coffee barista compared to a guy who works as a programmer in, in, in Infosys, you kind of get the sense of the the enormous um, um, gap that still exists at the time it's going to take to for that to become a little more egalitarian. Yeah. We're going to end on this note. Um, thank you, Michael, for, for an incredible talk.